Sounds Go good. Alrighty, everybody ready to get started? Hopefully everyone was able to log on successfully. Thank you to Steve for setting this up for me. Thanks to everybody for joining us here and joining us online via Skype. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, physical therapy care concerns for a postpartum patient. Now this was a course that I took through the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehab Institute. Um, so there is a little bit of like women's health type um, things in here, but I'm trying to make it generalizable because we've all had patients that have had children, they're in their childbearing years or maybe post childbearing years. Um, so just some, some concerns that I thought would be helpful when we're evaluating our female patients that have had children. I can just advance it this way. That's the point. No, you know, it's not working. Okay. Well, that isn't either. So. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So basically, the stage of postpartum is defined as the first six weeks after childbirth. And it's defined this way because this is um, basically the end stage for placental site healing. Um, but as we know, basically, we can consider postpartum phase to be throughout the um, after the first year after a baby is born. Um, just the definition, common term that um, you might hear involution is the change that the reproductive organs go through after childbirth. And this process begins immediately after childbirth. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the changes that we might see in here. And, and you can look for to expect, but I'm not going to get too deep into most of it. Basically, cardiovascularly, cardiac, cardiac output returns to pre-pregnancy levels by 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. Um, your blood clotting factors are going to remain temporarily elevated. Um, so really important, if you are seeing someone who's recent within this time frame, you want to monitor for DVTs. Um, and then basically, you're going to have an increase in your stroke volume, which decreases your heart rate. So heart rate should return back to like a, a normal resting level within that same time frame. Um, neurologically, you're going to have fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Sometimes this can cause headaches. Um, also, with the neurologic changes, and I'm going to get into this in a couple of slides, you can also have a, um, headaches from post uh, punctures from the epidural um, during the labor and delivery. The endocrine system, non-nursing mothers return to menstruation in about seven to nine weeks. This is an average. It could be less. It could be more. Um, lactating mothers, um, it depends on, on how long they decide to breastfeed for, but it could occur anywhere from eight weeks to 18 months. And just to note, the ovulation can occur even without um, menses. So just making sure that new moms are aware if they're breastfeeding, um, that they still have a chance of getting pregnant again. Um, endocrine system, again, weight loss, about 10 to 13 pounds are lost during childbirth. By the end of the first week, you can lose anywhere from an additional five to nine pounds and return to pre-pregnancy weight because this is probably the top question that a lot of your patients will ask you, anywhere from six months to a year, sometimes more. <coughs> um, the other um, important topic I want to touch on a little bit is gestational diabetes. So um, if, if somebody had gestational diabetes, there's an increased risk of developing diabetes mellitus after pregnancy. So you really want to um, make sure that you're at least asking your patients about it and making sure that they're following up with their doctors because most of the time after that six-week follow-up with their gynecologist, they're not following up with anybody. So you want to make sure that they're getting tested to make sure that there's no evidence of um, developing diabetes um, postpartum. Uh, another kind of red flag, something to screen for with your patients. Um, during pregnancy, your thyroid does enlarge and you have an increase in the T4 and T3 hormones. Um, so sometimes some women will develop postpartum thyroiditis. This occurs in about 5 to 10% of women with a 20% reoccurrence rate over subsequent pregnancies. Um, and if you have 
family history of thyroid dysfunction or you yourself have a history of thyroid dysfunction, there's an increased risk of developing this postpartum. So there's two phases. The first is a thyrotoxic phase, which is one to four months post-delivery. Some things you want to be aware of and look for would be anxiety, insomnia, heart palpitations, fatigue, irritability. Um, the second phase, which is about four to eight months after delivery, would be fatigue, weight gain, constipation, depression, or poor exercise intolerance would be things that we're picking up more of in here. And again, if your patients are reporting any of these things to you, you want to refer them to their doctor to make sure that they're having their thyroids tested. Um, you know, a lot of these complaints and symptoms are also consistent with um, some postpartum depression type of complaints. So you just want to make sure you have a conversation with your patient about some of the things that they're feeling and experiencing and know when to refer them to see either their family doctor or their gynecologist. Again, if you suspect any of these, you want to send them to their doctor. It's commonly missed and postpartum follow-up rate is low because again, after, after their six week follow-up and their physician clears them, they don't usually see them until um, their next annual gynecology visit. So, and we could screen for this very easily. Again, if they're complaining of these symptoms and they have some of those things in their history, you can palpate for an enlarged thyroid. You, some, most of the time you can see it if it's enlarged. So um, just a simple way of documenting and when you, you know, call the physician, you have that information to give them to. All right, so now we're gonna get into our bread and butter, the musculoskeletal system. So in the immediate postpartum period, your hormones are gonna take about six to 12, 12 weeks again to get to that homeostasis. So um, relaxin and progesterone are two of the biggest hormones that cause ligamentous laxity in the pelvis during pregnancy. So these are gonna gradually subside immediately postpartum. So ligamentous stability should improve to an extent. And I'm gonna highlight that um, because unfortunately, um, we would love to think that our bodies go back to the way they were before pregnancy, but unfortunately they don't and that's where we come in. Um, all right, again, just a couple of red flags. This is only if you're really seeing a patient in an early postpartum period, but if they have persistent bleeding, if they have a fever that can indicate an infection, either from a cesarean section um, or urinary tract infection, or again, screening for that uh, deep vein thrombosis. And then again, depression. Um, again, it's just a conversation that we should be having with our patients because um, a lot of times it could last more than just a couple weeks um, postpartum. So, and I'm going to talk about postpartum depression screening. That's three simple questions. Very easy. I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, other orthopedic injuries that could occur during labor and delivery. You could have joint injuries from compression or cartilage tears, nerve injuries from stretch applied. Um, most of these due to like the labor and birthing positions. Um, traditionally the lithotomy position, which is when the woman's on her back and her hips are flexed um, muscularly, the pelvic floor muscles, and then of course um, fracture of the coccyx is not uncommon. All right, so some of the most common complaints postpartum in regards to the spine and trunk are neck strain, postpartum headaches, thoracic pain, and lumbar pain. Uh, postpartum neck strain, um, again, is a lot of time precipitated from posture that's developed while pregnant. Um, we get this increase in, in the thoracic kyphosis and an increased cervical lordosis. Um, and it's um, postpartum with handling the baby, with breastfeeding, holding the baby, carrying the baby gear. All of this is going to be exacerbated, especially when the mother is fatigued and tired and just trying to care for the, the newborn baby. They put themselves second. Um, risk factors for headaches postpartum or history of headaches, multiparity, meaning they've had more than one child, increasing age, and an inadvertent dural puncture. So again, it's basically like we would screen any other orthopedic patient that comes in. So we'd make sure, um, you know, if there's a mechanical, neurological 
vascular in this population specifically, there may be more of a hormonal reason for the headaches. And this is due to the change in estrogen levels immediately after delivery. Again, um, these are just a couple of red flags to look for in terms of screening our patients, but this, this applies to all of our patient caseload, not just postpartum. But some red flags would be to look for um, new neurological signs, like a change in the, the prior character of the headache, um, sudden or severe headache, uncontrollable vom vomiting, change in mental status, or if it's unrelieved with medication. So the postpartum dural puncture, puncture headache, um, it occurs in about 1% of patients, but in this 1% group, about 70% of the patients develop a resultant headache. And it usually occurs about 24 to 48 hours after the puncture happens. <clears throat> what happens is when they puncture, when they do the epidural, there's a decrease in cerebral spinal fluid um, and it places a stretch on the meninges. <coughs> Um, so that can cause pain, like a severe headache, pain in the frontal and occipital lobe that radiates into the neck and shoulders. And a lot of times patients will go home and develop this headache and then they get readmitted to the hospital because it's so severe. Um, so usually treatment is hydration, analgesics, um, caffeine, and a lot of time an epidural blood patch. Um, again, so when we're evaluating our patients, like we do all of our other orthopedic patients, we're going to observe posture first and foremost. Um, you know, we really want to look for things that, uh, postures that have occurred during pregnancy that precipitated past that. Um, it's great to have patients sometimes bring their young children in so we can see how they're holding them, see how they're handling them. A lot of times, as a mom, you hold your, your baby either on one hip um, and the, or on the front, and we kind of get this increased lumbar lordosis. Um, you know, we're kind of hinging on our hips a little bit. We get hyperextension through our knees. We round our shoulders. So it's overall posturally a mess. So I always recommend starting with posture because it tells you a lot about their function. Um, some other things to look at that you might want to evaluate the rib cage mobility. So during pregnancy, as the, the uterus and the baby are growing, um, they actually, they take, you know, up more room and it causes your ribs to kind of flare a little bit and they get stiffness and then they develop altered breathing patterns. So you want to look at the rib cage mobility, you want to look at the breathing pattern. Um, something good to go over with them is to teach them how to breathe properly again. Teach them to breathe through their abdominals, breathe through their ribs, breathe through their upper chest. <clears throat> and then look at this in varied positions, not just laying down on the table because that's not super functional. Um, you want to look at their you know, their abdominals because they are over lengthened. And of course, thoracic spine mobility, which you could do in um, prone or sitting. Again, lumbar spine pain is one of the most common complaints during pregnancy as well as in the postpartum period. Um, common muscles that are overactive to evaluate would be the psoas, quadratus lumborum, and the erector spinae. Um, this was a study done on the impact of postpartum lumbopelvic pain in women that were three months postpartum. So there were 272 women in the study. They looked at the Oswestry Disability Index, the VAS, the health-related quality of life, um, activity level, depressive symptoms, and the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia. So 33% of the patients had lumbopelvic pain, 40% of them reported moderate to severe pain. And this is only three months postpartum. Um, and 53% reported disability explained by their pain intensity and quality of life. Um, another study that was done in 2009 is a follow-up study of women who reported low back pain and pelvic pain while pregnant. Um, so this was about 600 women 96% of those women were able to successfully breastfeed after delivery. Um, and basically they found that at six months postpartum, um, they all had continuous low back pain. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the pelvic girdle. Um, the pelvic girdle consists of two anominates, the sacrum and a coccyx, um, your sacroiliac joints and your pubic symphysis joint. 
And the proposed cause for most pelvic girdle complaints during and after pregnancy is instability. And that's due to the hormones, the relaxing and the progesterone that we discussed earlier. Um, here are two studies. One was in 2006 that reported a prevalence of about 50% of pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy. And then a study that was a little bit older now, but basically showed that one in four women develop preg who develop preg pelvic girdle pain during pregnancy develop chronic postpartum pain. Um, some risk factors in developing pregnancy-related pelvic girdle pain. Um, this uh, basically the the author identified um, four subgroups of pain. So one was unilateral sacroil sacroiliac joint. Um, another was bilateral sacroiliac joint pain, um, and then pelvic girdle syndrome, which is basically SI, your SI joints and your pubic sym symphysis and just miscellaneous pain. Um, in that study, about 500 women were considered in the disease group, but they were all later in their pregnancy. So they were already in their third trimester when they were um, complaining about some of these issues. Again, risk factors for developing pelvic girl pain during pregnancy, history of low back pain, um, previous back pain or trauma, like high levels of stress, multi-peri, again, meaning you've had more than one child or more than one pregnancy, um, and low job satisfaction. Um, a lot of times during pregnancy, in regards to SI joint, it might not be joint pain, it might be the dorsal sacral, sacral iliac, dorsal sacral ligament that's irritated. So this study just showed that in 30 women that were exam examined between eight months gestation and three months postpartum, 36% of them had irritation in their dorsal sacral ligaments. And only 10% of the subjects in the study reported no pain at all after the eighth month of gestation. All right, so this was another um, study It's called the MOM at work cohort study that was done in 2012. So it's a Dutch study. So about 548 women from 15 different companies and they wanted to look at the which factors predicted pelvic girdle pain at 12 weeks postpartum in working women. So basically at the time, most women go back to work. 50% um, of them reported a low level of pelvic girdle pain with low disability, low disability at 12 weeks postpartum. Um, and the predictors of them developing pelvic girdle pain postpartum um, was higher somatization during pregnancy. So basically, the reason that I'm going over some of the risk factors for developing pelvic girdle pain during pregnancy is um, your patients that, that do develop that have a higher chance of having pain postpartum as well. So I mean, when, you, when we're seeing our patients, whether they're six months, a year, five years postpartum, and they've had one or more children, we wanna be asking them questions about their pregnancy. Did you have back pain during pregnancy? Um, did you have back pain you know, early on postpartum? Um, Cause that's gonna give us some information about maybe some of the sources of their symptoms. So the conclusion of this study was, maybe we should be paying a little extra attention to women with pelvic, pelvic girdle pain during pregnancy to avoid severe pain developing afterwards. Uh, pubis, symphysis, pubis symphysis dysfunction. So there's a couple of different um, categories that we can put this in. So symphysis pubis dysfunction is a movement disorder related to instability. Diastasis symphysis pubis is the actual separation of the joint. And osteitis pubis, which we see sometimes with our athletes, is a non-infectious inflammatory condition. So the normal gap for the, the symphysis pubis is about four to five millimeters in a non-pregnant woman. During pregnancy, this increases by two to three millimeters. So a diagnosis of diastasis symphysis pubis would be anything greater than 10 to 13 millimeters on imaging with the presence of symptoms Typically, patients are going to present with a waddling gait. 
they're going to complain about popping in the front and the joint self. Um, any type of activity where they're single leg weight bearing or they have to actively abduct their hip is going to be reported as painful. Clinically, we're going to have tenderness over the joint. You might feel palpable, palpable clicking with hip range of motion. They're going to have limited painful range of motion. Um, and then if you do any type of like SI joint testing, it's, they're prob it's probably going to be positive and painful. So again, conservative treatment of this would be bed rest and gradual mobilization. We want to protect the joint. So early on, we want to work on motion control um, and stability and then progress this into functional tasks. Um, <clears throat> sometimes in patients that have high levels of pain, we can work on releasing some of the deep and superficial muscles and then work on like retraining, so motor control. Um, and also, again, in severe cases, we can also recommend bracing. Um, and a lot, you know, most of the time conservative care is successful despite the severity of the diastasis. It's, it could just take time depending on how much inflammation is present because of it. Um, and just to note that <clears throat> if your patient has any type of hypermobility, such as Ehlers-Danlos, um, they have a higher incidence of developing pubis symphysis um, diastasis during pregnancy. So again, just go over the real quick, um, just put this in there as a review of the, the nine point biting hypermobil hypermobility scale. If you're suspicious of that diastasis, this might be something you want to do with your patient. Um, some recommendations for joint protection would be to stand with even weight bearing, take smaller steps with walking, smaller movements with transfers, like getting in and out of the car, getting in and out of bed, um, you know, sit while dressing. And then just when we're teaching our patients how to do exercises, we want to cue them to activate their stabilizing muscles when they're turning in bed. And then sometimes, again, to use support between the lower extremities when they're sleeping on their side. Those are just some, some simple recommendations that we can make. Um, osteitis pubis or pubalgia, this is going to be something, again, that's more diagnosed um, with like a bone scan or pelvic x-rays, sometimes an MRI, blood test, um, but it's inflammation and sclerosis of the joint that can cause chronic pain. So a lot of times these symptoms might be even more severe. So they might have that midline pain, it might be radiating into their groin, they might have lower abdominal pain, um, tenderness over the pubis symphysis, which is similar to the other ones. Um, again, just something to be aware of um, that if our patients are not improving with conservative treatment, that again, we might want to refer them to their family doctor for x-rays just to see um, is there any evidence of sclerosis or the diastasis. So some simple tests that we could do to look at the pubis symphysis are some load transfer tests. So a single leg stance test, like a stork test. Um, so we're basically palpating um, posteriorly the SI joint and PSIS and we're looking for craniocaudal translation due to shearing and instability in the pelvis. Um, sometimes we'll see it posteriorly and they'll report pain anteriorly. Um, and an active straight, leg active straight leg raise test, which is a validated clinical test for assessing the load transfer between the trunk and the lower extremity with patients with uh, postpartum pelvic pain. Um, which is basically you're going to have the patient supine and you're going to ask them just to actively lift their leg, but just enough so that they're clearing the table, not not really high. Um, and we're looking at the contralateral um, pelvis, the ASIS, to see if it pops up. So that would indicate that they're not able to stabilize their pelvis on the opposite side. So when you're asking them to lift their left leg, we're looking at the stability on the right contralateral pelvis and vice versa. Um, and again, just like we would assess any other joint, we're palpating, we're assessing joint mobility. And then I always recommend um, assessing the adductors for trigger points. Some other things you could do, like I said, a lot of times that long dorsal ligament over the SI joint becomes inflamed and irritated. Um, so you might want to palpate that and see if this is a source of pain production. 
Um, and then our SI joint pr uh, provocation tests, um, the P4, the thigh thrust, Patrick's or Faber, um, Gaines lens, modified Trendelenburg, these are all appropriate tests to do. And again, this is that active straight leg raise test. Um, basically, we could test the active straight leg raise, and that gives us some information, but we could get more specific with it. So we could teach the patients, we could either passively or actively teach the patients to fire um, these local muscles um, and look for improved patterns. So we could stabilize the transverse abdominis and then have them repeat it and see, does that improve their stability? And then we could see that um, this might be an area of dysfunction that we need to work on. We could do the same thing posteriorly with the lumbosacral multifidi. We could have them do an active pelvic floor contraction and repeat it and see if there's some weakness in the pelvic floor muscles. Um, so you, you can definitely become more specific with it and you could either passively um, engage those muscles or teach the patient to actively do it and retest it. Just to go over quick form and force closure, Form closure is the joint structure, orientation, and shape, um, usually influenced by the capsule and ligamentous support. The force closure um, is those additional forces that are required to increase um, articular compression and stability, such as our muscles, our ligaments, and our fascia. Our local muscles and our deep muscles. Um, local muscles would be our transverse abdominis, our pelvic floor, and our multifidus. So these are the muscles that we want to take a look at first. Um, and then our global muscles would be our internal and external obliques, our rectus abdominis, and our rector spinae. These are just two pictures of, of my lovely models here um, demonstrating the active straight leg raise. So you can see on the picture on the left, we're just asking the patient to clear their foot, lifting it off the table. Um, and then we're looking at the contralateral hip and pelvis. And then the single leg stance is the same thing. We're looking ipsilaterally and contralaterally to see what the pelvis is doing to stabilize as we're lifting that leg actively. Um, and this would be, again, to kind of isolate some of those uh, deep muscle groups, such as the transverse abdominis and the multifidus. All right. Um, study done in 2009 on the prognostic factors for recovery from postpartum pelvic girdle pain. Um, 78 women were included in the study between six and 16 weeks postpartum diagnosed with pelvic girdle pain. The clinical tests were performed were the posterior pelvic provocation um, the active straight leg raise, and um, basically palpating the posterior dorsal ligament. Um, the positive predictors for improvement were if the patient had a positive active straight leg raise test, test and if they um, had a high belief in improvement. Um, another study by Hanfi et al. in 2011 on evaluation of lumbopelvic stabilizing exercises in the treatment of back pain after vaginal delivery. Um, 20 patients were included in this study um, suffering from low back pain. They're instructed in stabilization exercises, which included segmental stabilization in neutral spine and um, strengthening in various functional positions. Um, and the subjects reported uh, significant improvements in function and in pain complaints. All right, so I want to touch a little bit on um, going over a diastasis recti abdominis. Um, this is defined as the abdominal wall separation of the rectus bellies from the linea alba. The linea alba goes all the way from the xiphoid process um, to the pubic symphysis joint, so it's, it's a long structure. Um, so the prevalence of the diastasis rectus abdominis in some studies was about 66% of women in their third trimester of pregnancy. 53% um, of these women, so half of these women, um, the diastasis persisted postpartum. 36% um, of these at seven weeks and later. Um, and another study in 2007 um, actually went to a urogynecological clinic and they evaluated 
all of the women that were coming in there. Um, and they found that more than half of the women that were being seen for uh, urogynecological issues actually also had a diastasis. Um, risk factors for developing diastasis, rectus abdominis is age over 33, um, multiparity, so again, having birth more than one child, um, multiple gestation, uh, large baby, greater weight gain during pregnancy, and a C-section birth. So ultrasound is really the most reliable way for us to assess, um, measure the interrectus separation. Um, but we can assess it in uh, PT clinically using finger widths. So this obviously doesn't have great inter-reader -reli inter reliability because some people have small hands, some people, people have big hands. Um, but basically, if you have the patient lie hook lying, um, we want to assess at the umbilicus four centimeters at, at a minimum, four centimeters below and four centimeters above. But again, if you're suspicious, if it seems to be a wider diastasis or you think that there's more issues, I would assess all basically from the pubic symphysis up to the xiphoid process. Um, but you want to have them, I usually have them cross their arms um, and you're going to place your hands, you're going to sink down, you're going to put your hands basically perpendicular and you're going to sink down into the tissue and you're going to have them lift their head and their shoulders just so their scapula clear the, the table and um, you'll feel the gapping between the muscles. So a couple things you want to assess for is how many finger widths distance is between the rectus bellies. Um, you also want to assess, assess for like the depth of the tissue, like how deep are you, you going down? Um, and then just tissue quality. Um, you can note sometimes like when they lift their head, you might notice like a bulging or puckering or tenting sometimes we call it. Um, so you kind of want any of those qualities you want to take note of. So there's Lauren, Lauren assessing Kelly for me. Um, but this was at her umbilicus. And we just have the patient just actively lift their, their head and scapula up off the table. And sometimes this can be a little bit harder to do in a patient that has more adipose tissue. Um, so it can take a little time. Um, but it's definitely something that um, is worth doing because there's a high correlation between abdominal muscle dysfunction and patients that are reporting low back pain. Um, rehabilitation of diastasis rectus abdominis. Um, PT has been demonstrated to be an effective management approach for patients with this condition. Um, and again, importantly, we we'll always go back to pregnancy, but um, prenatal exercise directed at light abdominal strengthening has decreased the incidence or the severity of the diastasis rectus abdominis postpartum. Um, there are other, so it can actively, we want to teach the patients how to fire their, their deep muscles. Um, so usually the first thing we start with teaching how to do is how to perform a TA contraction. Um, and there's exercises that we can do while we're actually having them passively um, approximate the rectus abdominis either with their hands um, or using a sheet kind of fold it across them like a brace and have them pull on the sheet passively um, while they're actively um, actively using their TA muscles and again this is something you would start with supine and you progress to functional positions um, they want you want to teach them how to avoid bearing down avoid the valsalva um, and then passively, we can do things. We can recommend binders. Um, we could do McConnell or kinesio taping sometimes just to help give the patient um, input and like proprioception to the muscles while we're working on regaining the motor control of those muscles. Um, Diane Lee, who is like a pioneer in this field, especially women's health, um, states the goal is not to close the diastasis, but rather to generate proper tension through the muscles again the proper force tension relationship. So a lot of patients are going to be concerned about um, aesthetics and looks, um, but just, you know, we want to make sure that we, we can strengthen the muscles again. And a lot of times we can improve the width of it. Um, but again, the more severe diastasis that, that are out there, 
um, you know, we're not going to be able to close that completely. Um, something else, again, to consider, patients that have had C-sections, we want to at least evaluate their, their scar if they feel comfortable with us doing that, um, because the scarring may affect the repair of the abdominal muscles and the function of the ab abdominal muscles. Um, so again, we're just assessing the functional limitations, the depth, the amount of scar tissue. We're going to look for hypomobility. We're going to look for pain. Um, we can do scar tissue releases. We could teach the patient how to do scar tissue massage and releases and help to optimize their abdominal muscle function. And of course, you always want to wait until they're cleared by their doctor to do any of that. All right, really quick aside on the pelvic floor. I'm not going to get too much into that, but I just want to make everyone aware of when it would be appropriate to refer a patient for pelvic floor therapy. Um, so basically, the pelvic floor muscles um, sit inside the pelvis. If you think of the pelvis like a bowl, they sit inside the pelvis like a bowl or like a sling. So some of the important functions of the pelvic floor muscles are to support the pelvic organs, reproductive, bladder, bowels. Um, they have a sphincteric function, so they help with the conscious control of our bowel and our bladder. They do have um, sexual function, and they help to stabilize our, our lumbopelvic joints, and they work as a sump pump as well. So as we know, during pregnancy, the pelvic floor becomes challenged because of the, the uterus and the baby growing, it puts more pressure down on the pelvic floor muscles, can cause weakness and dysfunction. And then in labor and delivery, um, our muscles are challenged even further. So some of the most, you know, some common complaints you may or may not hear would be urinary incontinence, which can include anything from increased urgency and frequency, um, retention of urine, Again, leakage, it could be anything from like, I can't hold my urine to I cough and I laugh and I pee, um, which would be considered stress incontinence. Um, sometimes fecal incontinence is not uncommon. Pelvic and perineal pain, dyspareunia, which is painful intercourse, and pelvic organ prolapse. It, again, it just might be something you could screen your patients with by asking them a couple of, of questions. This could be something immediate postpartum. It can be something that's continued over time because they think it's normal um, and that it's going to get better on its own. But the earlier that we can help patients with some of these things, um, the, the faster they'll, they'll improve. And also, you know, if, they're, if they have weakness in their abdominals and some of their other um, muscles and joints, they may also have pelvic floor weakness. So it's just a good screening technique just to have a conversation with them and ask them if they're experiencing any of this. Um, this was a study done in two 2013 by Mork, Fed, and Bo on the effect of pelvic floor muscle training during pregnancy and after childbirth on the prevention and treatment of urinary incontinence. It was a systematic review. So it included 22 randomized or quasi-experimental trials. Um, and basically, it showed that pelvic floor muscle training during pregnancy and after delivery can prevent and treat urinary incontinence. And this includes a supervised training protocol following strength training protocols of at least eight weeks. That's the key here. So again, if your patients are complaining about any of these symptoms, you know, refer them to, you know, either Julie or Lauren or myself. Or you could always email us with questions because it could be something that we could kind of help you guys with. Um, a lot of patients, again, postpartum, might report an episiotomy or a perineal laceration. So an episiotomy is a surgical procedure performed um, to enlarge the vaginal opening for delivery. And the perineal lacerations are the tears that occur naturally. And you can see there's first through fourth degree tears. Um, the first degree is just the vaginal mucosa and the skin. Um, and then, of course, it gets progressively uh, more severe, all the way up to a fourth degree, which goes through the anterior rectal wall and the internal anal sphincter. So when we have patients that have a rotator cuff muscle tear, do we not see them for therapy conservatively? Do we see them postoperatively? So, you know, if this is something, again, a conversation you feel comfortable having with your patient, 
ask them if they've had if they had a perineal tear during delivery if they're complaining about some of these other pelvic floor symptoms because it's something that we can again address and work on um, with pelvic floor therapy with with PT so again I don't expect y'all to be asking a ton of pelvic floor questions with your patients but especially if you're seeing women that are um, postpartum whether it's six months or two years or five years um, just ask them some screening patients, you know, or screening questions. If they feel comfortable having that conversation with you, um, you know, you might be able to help them more than they realize. All right, I'm gonna go really quickly into some upper quarter complaints, just things that, things that are commonly seen. Um, shoulder girl, dis girl dysfunction, again, postpartum activities, added strain due to posture and biomechanics, bathing the baby, feeding the baby, um, crib mechanics, uh, car seat mechanics. Um, of course, everything, the height of cribs and changing tables is, is uh, not great. So a lot of times new moms are kind of straining to lift the baby up and over. Um, and again, they're not thinking about themselves, they're only thinking about the baby. Um, so this can cause some shoulder girdle and even some thoracic spine dysfunction. Um, an upper extremity nerve pain. Again, we're assessing neurodynamics. Um, carpal tunnel is really common during pregnancy and usually resolves after, but um, some women might have some, um, some remaining pain afterwards. Elbow pain, tendonitis, tendinopathy, carrying that heavy car seat, lifting the baby, repetitive tasks, postures with breastfeeding, um, hand and wrist pain. Again, th these are all due to more like mechanical stress postpartum, but de Quer veins is pretty common, um, trigger, trigger finger, and like, again, carpal tunnel. Lower quarter complaints, um, hip pain. Sometimes uh, if there's a labral tear that could have occurred during delivery, or maybe they had it um, beforehand and it was aggravated during delivery, so it's something you could kind of screen for. Um, lower extremity nerve injuries, um, usually associated more with nulliparity. So women that have never had any children um, during their first labor and delivery, and um, if they have a prolonged second stage of labor, which basically is more time spent pushing. Um, and lateral femoral, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is the most commonly injured nerve during childbirth. Um, study done of, of the incidence and postpartum nerve injury revealed like about 56 out of 6,000 women had a new nerve injury, which isn't too big, but again, it's, it's possible. Um, okay, so again, I just wanted to touch a little bit about some things that you might have someone come in with um, low back pain is our primary complaint, but just asking some of those questions, like, you know, um, or they might, might complain about wrist pain with low back pain. So just, just some questions that you can screen your patients with. It might not be um, their back pain might be their main concern, but they might also be experiencing some of these other issues too. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to touch on postpartum depression. Um, really important just to screen your patients if you're seeing them earlier on. Um, some signs to look for would be apathy, lack of interest, lack of energy, anorexia, sleeplessness, kind of verbalizing like feelings of, of failure. Um, really easy way that we can screen patients and again, no one to refer them is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. It's a shortened version. So typically this test is longer, but this is a short screen you can do and then you could refer them to see um, a physician or psychiatrist if they need to. Basically you just ask these three questions. Um, if I blame myself unnecessarily when things go wrong, if I've been anxious or worried for no good reason, or if I feel scared or panicky for no good reason. And if they answer yes to those three there's a 95% sensitivity. Um, so again we want to refer these patients. It's super important. Return to fitness is a big one. So 
ACOG recommends that women return to exercise when it's medically safe. So at a minimum, we're, you know, women are cleared usually there's six week postpartum follow up for exercise and activity, but they're not always ready to go back to their previous activity level at that point. Um, so we need to take into account their previous fitness level, their fitness level during pregnancy, um, and then after birth. So we want to make sure that we're individualizing this to each patient, each patient, um, and that you know we're promoting them to go back into activity in a, in a safe manner. So just in summary, pa patient history is important. So again, we could have a woman in her 50s that's had three children, and she's coming in. She's had low back pain for years. Um, ask her a little bit about her her childbearing history. You know. How many children does she have? Um, how many pregnancies did she have? How did she deliver? Was it a C-section? Was it vaginal? Um, did she have pain or issues during her pregnancies? Because some of the, it might point to some things that are contributing to her chronic issues. Um, and again, just some of the, the, you know, just the pelvic floor screening questions. Do you have any incontinence or any pain? It's also a good way just to do a quick screen and see if there's um, like a component going on with their pelvic floor. So like I said, I know a lot of this was kind of specific to an, like an earlier on postpartum phase, but I think that we can generalize some of it to our orthopedic population. Um, like I said, women that have had children. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? About anything. I know. Any anybody on Skype with any questions? Hopefully. Thanks, Alex. Hopefully you guys learned something. Like I said, I know it can be overwhelming. Um, not everyone wants to see women like immediately postpartum, but um, I think it's important. It should be part of the protocol um, because we can definitely help get them back to where they need to be. So thank you. Thanks, everybody.